You are listening to Bonafide Needs, Season 2, Episode 6. Welcome back to this episode of Bonafide Needs. I'm Bill Olver, Managing Editor of the PubK Group. Later in this episode, I'll be talking with Arnold and Porter's Kristen Ittick about a Supreme Court case that could rearrange what federal contractors know about the Christian doctrine. But first, let's take a look back at some topics we've been following on the podcast, as well as some recent developments in federal contracting. In June, the White House and Congress closed a deal to suspend the debt ceiling until January 2025. The bipartisan legislation also cut a projected $1.5 trillion from the federal budget over the next decade. Certain programs would see spending in 2024 remain flat compared to 2023 levels, and later funding increases would be limited to 1% in 2025. On June 16th, the Supreme Court issued a ruling affirming the federal government's authority to dismiss key TAM cases even when the Department of Justice has initially declined to intervene. In its 8-1 to decision in Polanski v. Executive Health Resources, The court rejected a relator's assertion that unless the government joins a case at the outset, it cannot later intervene to dismiss the case over a relator's objections. Nonetheless, the court held that the government's authority is not completely unfettered as the government requested. Instead, the court held that the government must articulate a reasonable purpose for dismissal. If the government meets this standard, courts should grant the motion to dismiss even if a relator presents credible arguments to the contrary. In his dissent, Justice Clarice Thomas argued that the text of the FCA does not provide the government unilateral authority to dismiss a pending action after it has declined to intervene. Interestingly, Thomas also cited serious constitutional questions about whether a relator can even proceed with the case when the government does not intervene. Those concerns were shared by Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett, though both concurred with the holding in Polanski. In recent months, the court has also turned its attention to enforcement of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. In another unanimous decision in SEC v. Cochran, the Supreme Court held that laws empowering federal agencies to enforce laws such as the FCPA do not preclude federal courts from hearing constitutional challenges to those enforcement actions. Now the court has also announced that it will hear Jacquesi v. SEC, which questions whether the Securities and Exchange Commission's administrative law courts violate the Seventh Amendment's guarantee of a jury trial and the separation of powers between the judicial and executive branches. The plaintiff in this case is challenging language in the Dodd-Frank Act that empowered SEC's courts to enforce security laws, including the FCPA, regardless of whether the entity is regulated by the agency. In May, the Seventh Circuit held that a $100 million settlement resolving alleged violations of the Anti-Kickback Statute and False Claims Act did not constitute restitution under Illinois law and therefore could be reimbursed by the payer's insurance. After the settlement was reached, Estellas Pharma sought the maximum $10 million in coverage from its DNO liability insurance policy with Federal Insurance Company. A dispute over this payment eventually ended up before the Seventh Circuit. The court held that since the case was never litigated and therefore there was no final adjudication as contemplated by the policy, Federal could not prove the settlement amounted to restitution, which could not be covered by insurance under Illinois law. The court reasoned that the insurance could not prove that Estellas would have been liable because the facts of the government's case did not definitively demonstrate Scienter. According to the Seventh Circuit, an implied allegation of fraud is not conclusive proof of such fraud. While the settlement agreement stated that half of the $100 million payment was restitution, the court concluded this language was for federal tax purposes and was not probative on the issue of Illinois law. A district court in Kentucky recently grappled with the issue of work product privilege in the context of the FCA, but it declined to articulate a standard that would have allowed a relator to protect certain communications. In Scott v. Humana, Inc., the district court sanctioned a relator for his repeated failures to produce documents and testimony related to meetings that the relator's expert had with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Department of Justice. Although it is clear that the court found this relator's pitch for work product protection sorely lacking, The court did not otherwise provide guidance about what facts would enable the relator to protect the communications between the expert and the government officials as work product. A bipartisan group of senators want Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to investigate allegations that several major defense contractors are engaged in price gouging. In a letter to Austin, Senators Bernie Sanders, Mike Braun, Chuck Grassley, Elizabeth Warren, and Ron Wyden cite allegations raised in the CBS News report regarding the practices. 
One investigation found that certain contractors, both large and small, had boosted their profit margins on some contracts to 40 percent, much higher than the typical margin of 12 to 15 percent. The senators asked Secretary Austin to investigate whether contractors are leveraging their position as sole suppliers of certain items to increase prices to the government. Industry representatives responded that the allegations were not based on recent data and that they had already been examined and found to be without merit. Several federal agencies, including the Departments of Justice, Commerce, State, and the Treasury, have published a joint advisory warning U.S. manufacturers of the possibility that low-technology items of domestic origin are being used in Iran's production of unmanned aerial vehicles. The agencies warned that these items might not be included on the Commerce Control List of the Export Administration regulations, but should still be identified as diversion transshipment concerns. The guidance also clarifies government expectations for private industry compliance programs, identifying red flags for Iranian importers attempting to procure these parts, and best practices for how to address them. To emphasize the issue, the agencies declassified information detailing Iran's proliferation activities in the region, which include construction of a manufacturing plant in Russia. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs has released its latest corporate scheduling announcement list for construction contractors. OFCCP identified 250 federal contractors and subcontractors for audits. OFCCP last released a CSAL for construction contractors in 2021. The White House has extended its deadline for agencies to begin collecting secure software development statements from software vendors. While the Office of Management and Budget set an initial target date of June for these collections, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency did not publish its draft collection form until late April, with comments due by June 26th. OMB has now set an open-ended deadline, instructing agencies that they must begin collecting secure software development statements three months after CISA's final form is published, whenever that may be. The CEO or designated employee of the software vendor must sign the forms to attest that their products comply with NIST software development guidance. Effective June 2nd, a new interim rule prohibits the presence or use of the TikTok video file sharing app in the performance of a contract. Any solicitation issued on or after June 2nd must include the clause at FAR 52.204-27, Prohibition on a ByteDance Covered Application. Solicitations issued before June 2nd but yet to be awarded must be amended by July 3rd, 2023 to include this clause. Future options or contract modifications that extend the period of performance must also include this clause. This rule applies to all solicitations, including those for commercial off-the-shelf items, as well as solicitations at or below the simplified acquisition threshold. The National Institute of Standards and Technology recently updated Special Publication 800-171, Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information in Non-Federal Systems and Organizations. According to NIST fellow Ron Ross, one of the authors of the new draft, the update includes five new specific requirements for protecting CUI from unauthorized disclosure. The guidance removes or consolidates some older requirements while adding new requirements and providing new details and explanations of existing controls. Significantly, the scope of the guidance is expanded to cover all non-federal entities that handle CUI, including contractors, subcontractors, and other third-party service providers. SP 800-171 is required reading for defense contractors, as compliance with its guidelines is mandatory under the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Experts advise defense contractors to keep up with the changes, even though the regulations implementing CMMC have yet to be released. That rule is expected to simply reference SP 800 so contractors should familiarize themselves with its guidance and prepare to implement it. Defense Department CISO Dave McCowan said that his office will produce a cybersecurity plan for the defense industrial base by November. According to McCowan, the strategy will bring together multiple plans from within the department and overlay everything on top of the NIST cybersecurity framework. DOD contracting officers may also consider compliance with SP 800-171 as part of their review of supplier risk and responsibility. The Department of Defense recently issued a final rule amending the DFARS to require contracting officers to use supplier performance risk system assessments when evaluating proposals and quotations and to consider those risk assessments when determining contractor responsibility. The SPRS aggregates contractor data from the Federal Procurement Data System, Defense Contract Management Agency, Contractor Performance Assessment Report System, and other sources to assess 10 factors, including price delivery time, use of suspected counterfeit items, and corrective action requests. Supplier risk and confidence reports consider whether current pricing is in line with historical prices paid and whether an item has been discontinued by a manufacturer or has an increased risk of counterfeiting. 
SPRS also contains contractors' confidence assessments against NIST SP 800-171 and their cybersecurity plans. On April 27th, the Small Business Administration issued a final rule that will make a number of changes to SBA regulations affecting small businesses. Effective May 30th, the new regulations provide new penalties for noncompliance with the limitations on subcontracting rule, update SBA's joint venture and size requirements, and make changes to the ostensible subcontractor rule. The rule clarified how the ostensible subcontractor rule should apply to general construction contracts and added factors to consider in determining whether a specific subcontractor should be considered an ostensible subcontractor. The rule takes into account the findings of the Office of Hearings and Appeals in Dover Staffing, Inc., in which OHA articulated a four-part test to indicate when a prime contractor's relationship with a sub is suggestive of unusual reliance under the ostensible subcontractor rule. And finally, in April, the Supreme Court announced it would take up yet another case with implications for federal contractors, a lawsuit involving the Department of Commerce's oversight of marine fishing vessels. We'll see the justices examine the 40-year-old Chevron deference. The court will decide whether it should overrule or clarify the previous holding. I recently had the chance to speak with Arnold and Porter partner Kristen Ittick, who explained the principles of the Chevron doctrine, how it is used in court, the current case before the Supreme Court, and how overruling the Chevron case could impact federal contractors. Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. Let's start by having you tell our listeners a little bit about your practice. Sure, thank you. Um, So I'm Kristen Ittig. I'm a partner at Arnold & Porter in the Government Contracts Practice Group. So my practice is about 50% um, litigation, working uh, with companies on claims and bid protests, and about 50% compliance counseling and working with companies on the unique regulations applicable to government contracts. And some of my niche practices deal with security clearances and with reverse FOIA litigation. We're here to discuss the Chevron Doctrine case that is before the Supreme Court. Now, they announced earlier this spring that they will take up this case. So give me a brief overview of the precedent and the case that establishes the Chevron Doctrine, and what does this mean? Sure. So the Chevron Doctrine is a principle of administrative law that really goes back about 40 years um, to the Chevron decision itself, but really wasn't groundbreaking at the time that it was made. It basically said um, when a federal court is reviewing a federal government agency's interpretation of an ambiguous statute, the court should defer to the agency's reasonable interpretation. So when reviewing an agency's construction of a statute that it administers, there's a two-step analysis. The first step is looking to the question of, has Congress directly spoken on the question at issue? And, And if so, the analysis is over. The court goes with what Congress has specifically said. The second step, if Congress has not spoken, then the court is to ask whether the agency's interpretation is based on a permissible construction of the statute. If the answer is yes, then the courts have largely deferred to the agency construction. So at its core, Chevron is really about separation of powers. Congress makes the laws, the executive branch implements them, and the judicial branch interprets them. If Congress has made the law and they've spoken clearly, game over. If the executive branch has implemented consistently with what Congress directed, it's game over. But the dispute we're seeing now is that the judicial branch has arguably deferred too much to the executive branch without doing its job of interpreting the law. And that's the Chevron controversy that we're seeing now. What specific issue will the Supreme Court consider addressing when this comes up for a hearing in the fall? So the case that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear this fall is Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo. Um, And in that case, a group of commercial fishing companies pushed back on the Secretary of Commerce and the National Marine Fisheries Service regarding implementation of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. The act has several provisions about monitoring programs. They put monitors on herring fishing boats in the North Atlantic to monitor and to gather data. And in some instances, like for foreign fishing vessels, the statute itself has a requirement that says that the boat owner has to pay for the costs of having the monitor on board. Um, In other instances, the statute doesn't say who pays the cost of having the monitor. The uh, Department of Commerce, through the Fishery Service, promulgated a rule that says that the industry has to pay for the monitors. The plaintiffs brought suit and argued that this was beyond what Congress authorized. At both the D.C. Circuit and the D.C. District Court, the court said, we've got to defer to any permissible construction of the statute that's adopted by the agency. 
The plaintiffs appealed that to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court granted cert, not on whether the fishery service had the power to force industry to bear the costs, but on this narrower question. And the question that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear this fall is whether the court should overrule Chevron or at least clarify that statutory silence concerning controversial powers expressly but narrowly granted elsewhere in the statute does not constitute an ambiguity requiring deference to the agency. So that's a mouthful, right? But what the court has done is said, we're going to look at this narrow question about one, should we overrule Chevron or should we just clarify that if one part of the statute says you can do this thing, another part doesn't, you know, is that an ambiguity where we've got to defer to the agency? Hmm. And that's what the court will hear this fall. Interesting. Uh, you know, the plaintiff here is not a government contractor. This case doesn't directly implicate government contracting, but considering the number of regulations that govern contractors and federal acquisition, this is certainly a topic of interest for anybody that does business with the government. So reading the tea leaves a little bit, what implications do you see um, for ruling that might limit the power of federal regulators and how might this affect contractors? Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Bill. This case is not about government contractors. There's no government contract involved in the Loper case at all. But the reason that it's of interest to the government contracting community really goes back to what the Chevron doctrine is, right? So the Chevron doctrine, it's originally about deference to agencies on statutory interpretation, but it's grown like many things over the last 40 years. And Chevron has been applied to regulations as well, and agencies get deference on how to interpret their regulations. So agencies draft the regulations, and then they get deference on how to interpret what they drafted in the first place. And then what is most relevant to government contractors, Chevron has been applied to government contracts as well. And some courts have said that agencies get deference on what the meaning is of the contract terms that they've drafted. Now, this is a little bit different from what we normally look at in contract interpretation, right? In contract interpretation, we normally say we're going to construe ambiguities against the drafter of the contract. But Chevron kind of turns that on its head and says the drafter of the contract, the, the government, really has the most expertise in what the meaning of these contract terms is. So under this expansion of the Chevron doctrine, some courts have said, we're going to defer to the government agencies on the meaning of contract terms. And that's where this gets really important for government contractors. Because if a government contractor has a dispute with an agency about the meaning of a contract term, they don't get the normal balanced judicial review necessarily that they would otherwise expect to get in a contract dispute. Because of the Chevron doctrine and its expansion in several of the circuits, there is a deference to the government on what the meaning of those contract terms is. So in this case, in the, in the Loper case that's coming up this fall, the court has been asked to throw out Chevron entirely. If the court throws out Chevron entirely, then along with it goes this application of Chevron to government contractors. So that's the part that is, is really important about this case this fall for government contractors is if the whole doctrine gets thrown out, then its application to government contracts also gets thrown out. I'm not sure whether we can expect that the court is going to do this or not, the court has had an opportunity in the past to look at the Chevron doctrine specifically in the government contracts context. In 2017, there was a case called Scenic America uh, that was up for Supreme Court review. And in Scenic America, the court had the opportunity to look at the Chevron doctrine as applied to government contract interpretation and could have taken this on directly. Um, the court did not grant cert in that, in that case, so they did not take the opportunity then back in 2017 to look at this directly. And so I wouldn't expect that they will be looking at it directly in a case that doesn't raise it um, you know, as well as the, as the previous case did. Right, right. That is definitely a range of outcomes uh, for for government contractors. Yeah, they they could upend quite a bit uh, depending on how they roll on this. That's fascinating. One of the things that I thought uh, is interesting about this Chevron doctrine for government contractors is that Justice Gorsuch has really been previewing for the last couple of years that this is an issue that he would like to take on. 
Um, in the Scenic America case, Justice Gorsuch wrote a statement and the Chief Justice and Justice Alito joined in it, talking about whether they ought to be examining this issue here or in another case. And then in the Buffington versus McDonough case in 2022, Justice Gorsuch again wrote about Chevron deference and whether it ought to be examined. In that instance, it was a, um, a veteran who was denied benefits based on the VA's interpretation uh, of its own regulations. And so Justice Gorsuch has really been laying a framework or laying a path for the last few years saying that we ought to be looking at Chevron deference in several different contexts. So it will be interesting to see what the court does now that it finally has a Chevron case directly before it where it has accepted cert. The briefs have been filed. There's a whole raft of uh, amicus briefs that have been filed here as well. And it will be interesting to see whether the court decides to take this on head on and take on the whole Chevron issue, or perhaps just carve out a smaller issue. But either way, this renewed interest at the Supreme Court level for examining what level of deference we give to agencies will be important for contractors to follow going forward. Well, we'll definitely be watching that, of course, especially noting that the makeup of the court has changed in a couple of years. If they haven't looked at this since 2017, there's been some dramatic changes in the justices. So it'll be very interesting to see how this pans out with them. It will. Yeah. There, are, there are only going to be eight justices hearing this case. One justice was involved in hearing this matter at the DC Circuit and so has uh, recused, but the other eight justices should all be participating. Well, we will be following that case over the next year or so until we have a decision. And maybe after oral arguments, we'll invite you back. We'd love to have you again, and we can uh, interpret the justices' questions and, and their line of inquiry and make it a second examination of that. Thank you. I look forward to that. Well, thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you for the time and that very insightful analysis that does open up a huge can of worms for contractors, and we'll definitely be keeping track on that. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Kristen for those insights into the Chevron case before the Supreme Court. We'll be following this topic when the Supreme Court holds oral arguments in the fall and when a decision is released next year. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Bonafide Needs. Thank you for joining us today. For more in-depth coverage of any of our topics, you can find links to our news articles and other sources in the show notes for this episode. For daily updates in federal contract disputes, compliance matters, and cybersecurity, you can subscribe to PubK at pubkgroup.com. For additional insights into these developments for federal contractors, you can follow multiple topical blogs at arnoldporter.com. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast via your favorite platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon. Thanks again for joining us. For PubK Group and Arnold and Porter, I'm Bill Olver, and we'll see you next time. Bonafide Needs is a joint production of and copyright Arnold and Porter, providing legal advice and thought leadership for government contractors, and the PubK Group, publisher of daily news and insights for government contractors and their counsel. This podcast is produced by Bill Olfer and Tina Chen.